thanks so much for having us here today. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I'm here and also would like to pay my respects to Elders past and present. I'm Karen Kemp and I'm a director of Red Box Design Group, Landscape Architects, and I'm here today with my colleague Olivia Ward, Senior Landscape Architect with our team. And so for those of you who don't know us um, at Red Box Design Group, we're a team of landscape architects based in the ACT and we're committed to sharing our journey of bringing joy to people who use the places we create. Are we done? Yep. Um, we've been invited here today by Julie, thank you, to show and share how we've designed in the provision of food and accommodation for bees and other pollinators in the suburb of McNamara. Now McNamara, as Matthew touched on, is the second neighbourhood to be designed in Gin and Derry. And we've been working with the Riverview team, with Matthew in particular, over the last couple of years. Gin and Derry aspires to be a green star sustainable community and not surprisingly, many of the core placemaking principles in designing a green star sustainable community resonate with us in particular as landscape architects. Oh, talk up, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> louder. Um, the Gin and Derry placemaking principles and Matthew spoke a little bit about them um, give us an excellent basis for provisioning food and accommodation for pollinators in particular. Connection to landscape, in which we aim to foster a deep sense of respect for the land, flora and fauna, and connecting the future residents of Gin and Derry to its built and natural environs. And in this regard, how we cater for pollinators within a suburb and sustainability. The creation of a landscape that is self-sustaining, resilient to our climate, including the use of green and growing infrastructure as a key element in our design work to achieve diversity in our flora and fauna. So how do we do this? So over the last few years, there's been an increasing awareness in the decline in bee numbers and we in the office often discuss how and what we can do to improve outcomes in new suburbs in particular. And we're really lucky that Gin and Derry organised for Julie and Cormac to give a presentation to Redbox and the broader design team for McNamara. And this was certainly informative and set off a crusade in making sure that the suburb was going to have foraging opportunities and homes for native bees. So as landscape architects, the open spaces and nature strips are our domain. And whilst there are many requirements and amenities that need to be provided for in a neighbourhood, the trees, shrubs and grasses that we choose play an important role in establishing a healthy and balanced and diverse ecosystem. So, Let's just visualise what happens when we start a new development. Typically it might go like this. We start with an open paddock that has some trees. We come in with some big machines and we scrape the land. A large few, a few large healthy trees might remain. Then roads and houses are built. Landscaping is completed with parks, <coughs> and nature strip trees. And then the residents move in and they plant a garden, maybe some tomatoes and beans. And at the end of summer, they haven't been able to harvest a single vegetable. Maybe this little guy doesn't have a green thumb. <laughs> or is it because the pollinators have packed their bags and gone? The previous slides show that what we've done is remove food and accommodation for bees and a vast array of insects and birds. And therefore we need to re-establish and reinstate habitat, as well as combat heat island, provide pleasant parks and places where we can recreate and enjoy nature. So after the talk from Julie and Cormac, I actually went home to my partner 
and thanked him for keeping all the dandelions and letting our rocket go to seed. <laughs> <laughs> but back in the office, we set about thinking on how we would create a suburb for people who could successfully grow a crop of tomatoes. And so how do we go about providing food for pollinators in our landscapes? A couple of key principles and facts for designing pollinator-friendly landscapes that we learnt were native bees generally have a hub and then forage up to around 200 metres. <coughs> native bees need a variety of incidental flowering plants all year. They're most hungry in January to March. Pollinator corridors are ideal in providing sufficient food and shelter and eucalypts are an excellent food source for native bees. A couple of key issues which inhibit pollinators in our landscapes. Monoculture or single species plantings with no variety, as this doesn't provide year round food source. Self pollinating species, which I think Cormac touched on, those that don't rely on insects such as plane trees, white poplars and rye grasses, don't provide any food source. And perfect green lawns, while they're beautiful, are the equivalent of a desert for a bee. So with this knowledge, we distilled some design principles for creating enough food and accommodation to support a species diverse suburb. Retention of the existing trees. By retaining existing trees, we also retain a percentage of the existing pollinator habitat and food source as a starting point. Green connections, the addition of green networks support not only bees, but a variety of wildlife to ensure our open spaces provide continuous links and act as stepping stones through the suburb. And pollinator corridors, by including pollinator tree species in the street networks, we further enhance the pollinator friendly ambition for the suburb. With these principles in mind and a big roll of tracing paper and some coloured pencils we began to colour in. And Matthew had the refined version, <laughs> but this is the rough version of the 200 by 200 metre grid, responding to the estimated flight range of a foraging native bee. And within each of these segments, we examined how to provide a year round food source. Within each grid, grid, we aim to have open space plantings that include native seasonal flowering plants, varying sizes to provide shelter and food sources for insects. So, the, so those levels of plantings. Native street trees in select streets, typically with a north-south orientation to limit any overshadowing of residences. And deciduous street trees, which is a fundamental resource, ensuring that a large percentage of the exotic species selected are flowering and pollinator friendly. So next we began designing the street tree configuration and the introduction of multiple tree species within a street not only responds to the varied street typologies that we have in the suburb, but also allows for increased shade and the inclusion of flowering pollinator friendly trees. And finally, we began to collate and organise our plant species palette. The municipal infrastructure standards has been recently updated to include information on species that are good for bees and other pollinators. And the great news is there's quite a few. Using these tables, we've mapped flowering times and colours and identified which pollinators are attracted to particular plants. And this helps ensure that we cater for all the different pollinators year round. And as we go into our next design phases, we'll be further refining this in a detailed design sense. And now I'll hand over to Olivia, who's going to speak about accommodation for bees. Thank you. Okay, so another important aspect 
of pollinator friendly landscapes is accommodation. And as part of our work on the suburb of McNamara, we aim to include a series of bee hotels across the neighbourhood. And today I'll just be sharing a bit of our experience building and designing one in Kingston. Locally, there are a variety of different styles, scales and materials that can be used to design a bee hotel. Locally, you can see built examples just right out here at the Gin and Dairy Display Village or at the National Botanic Gardens or, as I mentioned, in Kingston. As part of Floriada Reimagined, Redbox reinvigorated an existing garden bed on Kennedy Street. We ran an in-house design competition for its refurbishment and the winning design was a bee-friendly garden. The design included a variety of pollinator friendly plant species and signage provided by Julie at Act for Bees to educate visitors and raise awareness. It also included a mini bee hotel and feeder. The design include, oh sorry, the bee hotel design and material selection were based on the information available on the Act for Bees website. We constructed the bee hotel using steel, timber and bamboo and the feeder was made from a saucer filled with gravel and a Canberra bus stop themed shroud made from PVC pipe. Uh, we had a great time constructing the Bee Hotel feeder and garden and these are a couple snaps we took of the construction and installation process. It was installed in September last year and thankfully is still in its original form. We were conscious of the fact that this bee garden is located in public space and therefore needed to be robust and very hard to steal. <laughs> the finished product has been extremely well received by the community and it has flourished with all the recent rain. We are very proud of it and will continue to manage and develop it into the future. Uh, while building or buying a bee hotel, as Julie mentioned, can seem quite simple, um, it's important to know what native bees actually need and many of the bee hotels you'll find in stores um, aren't based on scientific studies of bee nesting and you're more likely to find wasps, spiders or cockroaches living in them. <laughs> so some key principles to consider for bee hotel design are using correct materials. So bamboo and timber are most commonly used and if you're using bamboo it should be bundled together and contained securely. Um, if you're using timber, it should be native and untreated species. So no um, varnishes or paints on the timber. Uh, also providing the correct hole dimension, again, as Julie mentioned, is super important. So the length and diameter do matter. Um, if they're too short, they'll limit the number of offspring bees can produce per nest and they'll also make them more prone to parasitic wasp attack. Um, also, to ensure the holes are blind is another important fact. So holes, I guess is what I'm trying to say, are really important. Um, so the holes need to be blind, meaning they need to be closed off at the end. So you should not drill all the way through a piece of wood or have bamboo pieces hollow the whole way through. Also providing a suitable location for your bee hotel is also important to attract pollinators. Accommodations should be located in a sunny spot, above ground and not hidden by vegetation. Finally, it's also to, important to remember that bees need water and therefore the availability of water also needs to be considered when you're locating a bee garden or a bee hotel. Mm -hmm. um, so as you can see, our work with Gin and Dairy and for Floriade has been influenced heavily by the advocacy of Act for Bees. We have adopted an approach to our designs that encompass a variety of considerations that support our native bees and which import, in turn support successful biodiversity outcomes. Our tools and training as landscape architects ensures that we can apply pollinator friendly principles across all our future projects from small scale design like little bee gardens to larger subdivision planning so that our winged friends have enough food and accommodation to help us grow our veggies. Hope you've enjoyed our presentation. <laughs> Thank you.